Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. And really, as a confession, I'll tell you that when I first came to Portland, um, moving up here from Arizona at the time, but having grown up in the South, someone said, we're going to take you for a lobster roll. And I thought that was like maybe an Easter egg roll. Maybe you went out on the lawn and you took the lobsters and rolled them down a hill or something. So since then, I've had quite a few lobster rolls. It's great to be here and to talk to you about the Portland Symphony Orchestra. I've just finished my second season as music director, and uh, we really just couldn't be happier about where the Portland Symphony is right now, what's going on artistically, um, and as our business model, financially, uh, lots of great things, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. I, I thought I would do this in the following format. First, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself and how I got into music. I think if you speak to five musicians, you'll get five unique stories as to how they found music or how music found them. Uh, then we'll show you a short DVD with some great information about the Portland Symphony, and then we'll talk about what's happening at, at PSO now. So I'll start by just, as we get to know each other, letting you know how I got to become a conductor, how I made this a profession. I am from Greenville, South Carolina. That's my hometown. If you, if you know the Carolinas, it's in upstate South Carolina. It's, Greenville's about the size of Portland and pretty similar in, in size and scope. Truth is, however, my family is from a place called Possum Kingdom, South Carolina. That's true. I did not make that up. Possum Kingdom. There was, as you would imagine, very little Bach, Beethoven, or Mozart in Possum Kingdom, South Carolina. Um, my family's not a musical family. My dad is a graduate of Clemson University and a mechanical engineer, and bless his heart, as we say in the South, he couldn't carry a tune in a wheelbarrow. And my mother plays the piano a bit, but it was sort of the old church hymnody, you know, playing Bringing in the Sheaves, where you bang the octaves with the left hand, that sort of thing. So this was really the, the music of, of my um, very young life. I have two older sisters, and as a lot of families did in, say, the late 60s, early 70s, we were pretty typical. My older sisters got piano lessons, and I got Little League. So in third and fourth grade, I was playing what was called termite league football. That's what I really remember about that time in my life. But also, an event happened that I barely, if at all, recall. The end of third grade, the public school strings teacher came to our class and told us how you could start playing a string instrument in the fourth grade. He did a demonstration. Here's the violin, the viola, the cello, the bass. Wouldn't it be fun to play a string instrument and join the strings class next year? If you're interested, I'm passing around a sign-up sheet. Sign your name, and then when fourth grade begins, you'll be in the strings class. As I say, I barely, really don't at all remember that event. I did not sign my name. I wasn't paying that much attention. I was thinking about termite league football. But in the beginning of fourth grade, um, this teacher came back, one of the first days of class, had the sign-up sheet in his hand, and called off the names on the list. And lo and behold, my name was on the list. I had no idea why it was there until a girl in my class, my third and fourth grade girlfriend, Sherry Bednar, she started laughing because she remembered that she had written my name down, <laughs> thinking that would be funny. How do you explain that as a nine-year-old to a teacher? I didn't. I just got up and went to the class. So I went to the class, and he showed us the instruments, and I chose the bass. I thought the bass looked interesting, and maybe even at that age, I'd probably seen a jazz combo. I had maybe an image of playing jazz with a you know, drum set and a piano. So I chose the bass, and my teacher said, well, you're actually too small to play the bass. So why don't we start you on the cello? You know, the cello is the one you sit and play. Why don't we start you on the cello, and then in a few years, when you grow, we'll move you over to the bass. I started on the cello. I realized I had an aptitude, a talent for the cello. I fell in love with the cello, and really, that's why I'm here today. So that was, that was the beginning. There's a quick uh, epilogue to that story. About 10 years ago or so, I went back and conducted my hometown orchestra as a guest conductor. That's the Greenville Symphony, not the Possum Kingdom Symphony, to be clear. <laughs> went back and conducted my hometown orchestra, and that teacher, my first strings teacher, was there, and we talked after the concert. I told him how I'd told the story many times about how I got into music quite by accident. And he said at that point, he said, well, the absolute truth is you were not too small to play the bass. I needed a cello in my class to fill out the string class. So, all true, all true. And I love to tell that story because um, it really speaks to the fact that you never know where the inspiration comes from and how someone finds their calling 
in life. And I think it's very true in music that often music finds us instead of us finding music. And this is a different lecture for a different time, but I would be remiss if I didn't say at this point that study after study after study verifies and validates that students who study a musical instrument have higher GPAs, higher SAT scores, higher level of admittance into college, specifically higher math and language scores. One of the greatest uh, uh, degrees searched for for medical school is an undergrad music degree and on and on and on. So if you are of like mind and have any chance ever to support music in the public schools, please do so. End of that soapbox. Let me give you a quick overview of what's going on in the American orchestras today and sort of how the American symphony orchestra world works. This is the nutshell. There are, um, these are round numbers, but there are about 800 orchestras in the United States. About half of those, close to 400, are community volunteer orchestras. There are 400 or so professional orchestras in the United States, and of those, they're divided into sort of two groups. There are about 45, which are full-time professional orchestras. Those would be the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the New York Philharmonic, the Chicago Symphony, on down to the Phoenix Symphony, the Fort Worth Symphony, the Rochester New York Philharmonic, etc. cetera. Um, those orchestras, the musicians, and there are usually, give or take, 100 musicians in those orchestras, they earn a full-time salary, benefits, that is their full-time job. The other 350 or so orchestras are regional orchestras per service orchestras. Portland is very proud to be at the top of that list, one of the finest and most respected regional orchestras in the country. We're a per service orchestra, which means that we pay our players by the service. A service is a rehearsal or a concert. So anytime they come and sit and we play together, we pay them a fee. If they play every service that we have to offer for the Portland Symphony, and depending on their life and lifestyle, they probably put together from the PSO one quarter to maybe one fifth of their overall salary. They put the rest of their life together as a musician by, they typically a lot of our players live in the Boston area or Portland. They run down and they play in the Rhode Island Philharmonic. They sub in the Boston Symphony. They play for Boston Ballet. They play for Boston Lyric Opera. They come up and play for Port Opera. They go and play a wedding and then run to a bar mitzvah and then to a party, and you see how that works. And they put their life together. They are in it clearly because they love it yeah? and, and not for the financial gain. Those are, the, those are the models, and the models in the past have not worked all that well for the American orchestra, and so some you probably have seen the news where in difficult economic times, orchestras take massive pay cuts or they die altogether. Portland is in a very proud place right now, and that's what I'll talk about after we...